When I first started preparing this video, um, it took me a while to figure out exactly how I wanted to present this video, this woman's story, because when I first read about it on Reddit, it was a case of an unidentified um, dead woman. But the more I read and the more I dug into it, it led to a completely different story that became an even bigger mystery. And as some of you may have watched, I just recently did a couple of videos on uh, women who uh, were thought to be from different areas of the country. One was from Indiana, Tracy Sue Walker. She ended up in the Knoxville area. Her remains were found. And the Blount County Jane Doe, who some believe is from the northern part of the country as well, maybe Illinois, and she also ended up in that area near Knoxville, and her remains were discovered. This, the story of this woman, she was also not from the Tennessee area, but she ended up in Tennessee, and luckily for her, her remains were not discovered on some back road in some creek many years after her death. Um, her story is a little bit more of a mystery, like I said, because how did she come to be at that house that night? A lot of people believed, and the homeowner, um, the police at first, believed that she was trying to break in to this home. And as I read about this story and came to figure out that she was, I believe she was running from these people. I believe she had been possibly a victim of trafficking, human trafficking. And I believe she was trying to get away. And I believe she ran to that home that night trying to get help, trying to get away from these captors. This could be wrong. I could be completely wrong about that. But as you read and listen to this story, you can draw your own conclusions. But that is what I came up with. She may have been traveling with these people. They may have picked her up hitchhiking somewhere or, you know, came into contact with her in some way. But at some point, I do believe she was trying to get away from them. I believe that she knew she was in danger. So that's how I wanted to present this story. And um, if you disagree, that's fine. Like I said, it's a mystery and um, it's up to everybody to decide how they view it and um, I hope you'll enjoy this video this one took me a little while to put together because I kept waiting for updates from the family once her identity was discovered I kept hoping that maybe somebody out there would come up with a a reason for you know but but her own family didn't know where she was at for many years and they were just as um, shocked by to learn that she was in Tennessee after so many years of not knowing what had ever happened to her. And this is the story of a young woman who was, for a very long time, she was known as Shotgun Jane Doe. And as you listen, her identity will be revealed. In June of 1987, a young girl was shot and killed in Knox County, Tennessee. Here is a brief narrative of the events. Percy Preston of Bristol, Virginia, was age 76, picked up three hitchhikers, two men and a young girl. He had left his home Saturday, May the 30th, 1987. Percy picked the three up Sunday morning. He claims he doesn't remember where he picked them up at. At some point, Percy claims the two men took control of his car, and they spent all day Sunday driving around Knoxville, Tennessee. At 1.30 a.m. Monday morning, police received a call at a rest stop on I-81 north of Knoxville about a disoriented, a disoriented elderly man. There they found Percy alone and without his car. He told them the story of the three hitchhikers. Almost exactly one hour later at 2.30 a.m. Monday morning, Knox County Police were called to a home on Jim Sturchy Road. The home was occupied by two young girls, Jennifer Northern and Tammy Holt. 
Holt had called 911 to report a woman who was screaming outside her front door. The woman was reportedly screaming, he has a knife. Northern grabbed a 12-gauge shotgun and yelled for the woman to leave, but instead the woman continued banging on the door, insisting that she be let in. She was able to open the door, and Northern fired her shotgun through the door, striking and killing the Jane Doe. Deputies found Percy's car two blocks from the home. The car was a 1977 Chevy Impala. Evidence in the car led to the arrest of John Calvin McCarter and Jury Lynn Brown. To this day, the girl that screamed, he has a knife, has never been identified. Both McCarter and Brown deny knowing her name. She was five foot four with brown hair and brown eyes, and she weighed around 100 to 110 pounds. She had a C-section scar on her stomach, and um, she was missing her lower front tooth. She had had a broken leg, and it was believed that it may have been injuries that she might have suffered in a car crash or that maybe she had fallen from a high distance. I now believe, and I think others as well believe, that she was running from these men. They were chasing her. When the police showed up, they were they could be heard on the 911 call in the background telling the woman on the phone that she's crazy, she's not, you know, because she was telling these people, he's got a knife, he's after me. She was trying to break into the home for her safety, not for any kind of theft or anything like that. So another article that I found on this story was from the Knox News. This is dated 2013. The Mystery of Shotgun Jane. Investigators know every detail of how she died, but they have no idea who she is. They know who fired the 12-gauge shotgun blast that killed her. They know even exactly how drunk she was, a blood alcohol level of 0.13. She's been dead for 26 years. That was about as long as she was estimated to have lived. Despite many news stories and circulation of a likeness of her, she still remains a Jane Doe. The Knox County Sheriff's Office is taking new steps to try to identify her. A computer aid a computer-generated age progression likeness of what she looked like before her death could help someone recognize her. The victim's death will not generate... Now see, here's where they're wrong, and I'm going to read this next part, and I feel like they're very wrong here, but this is from the standpoint, the viewpoint of the police. The victim's death will not generate much sympathy. On June the 1st, 1987, she and two men tried to rob a home in North Knox County. She paid dearly for her crime right on the spot, said David Davenport, head of the Knoxville Police Department cold case squad. We have kept trying to get her identified to finally give some closure to this story. The two men she was with said they had picked her up only a few hours earlier at a truck stop in Greene County and they, they claim they never knew her true identity. I don't believe that to be the truth either. And when it says that her story will not generate much sympathy, I think they found out just how wrong they were when people from Web Sleuths and the Doe Network and all these other people got together and, and were really trying to find out who she was. I think they, it generated a lot more sympathy than what they realized because just like my own self, I think a lot of people really believed that she was not trying to break into a home to rob or harm anybody, but that she was really a victim and that she was trying to get away from someone who had some sinister plan for her. And as drunk as she may have been, as she may have been under the influence of other substances that that doesn't matter um she came to realize i believe that she was in danger and was trying to get help and that does give her sympathy
And as far as the story goes, these two men told the police that they had only picked her up a few hours earlier. This old man whose car they stole claimed that, they, that he had picked them up the day before and that they had taken his car and driven around Knoxville all day before dropping him off or leaving him somewhere. And it was 1.30 a.m., only one hour before this happened and this woman was killed, that he called the police and, and you know, had them come pick him up, told them the story of, of these three. So I believe that they that she had probably been with them a little longer than that. How did they pick her up hitchhiking if they themselves were hitchhiking? They may have been in another stolen car, and when it ran out of gas, they just started hitchhiking, and this old man just happened to come along. So this is from Unidentified and Missing People. This is dated 2021. Shotgun Jane Doe, found in 1987 in Knox County, Tennessee, has been identified. After 34 years, thanks to the FBI fingerprint match, she was identified as 26-year-old Tina Marie Gatrell, missing from California. Knox County Regional Forensic Center identifies the 1987 cold case victim. They said it uses every means available to identify descendants using fingerprints, dental exams, x-rays, and DNA. But we know now that her DNA had not been entered into CODIS or some of these other databases. It was the fingerprints that eventually led to her identity. To jump ahead just a little bit in the story, in 1987, in 1986 rather, this young woman gave birth to a child in California. And because she had been deemed mentally incompetent to take care of the child, she had some arrest records and she was, it was reported that she had some mental health problems. At the time that she gave birth to the child, she was living in a, I guess, a residential home for people with mental health problems. She was placed in this hold, and she gave birth to her child. And due to her incompetence on the, uh, due to her mental incompetence, as they deemed it, the state took custody of her child and placed him in a foster home. They wanted her to agree to sign over custody and she refused. She was sent back to this home and eventually she just ran away. I'm, I'm guessing someone there at that home reported her missing and filed a missing person report, more or less just to say that she was, you know, had left. So here's the story. The Knox County Regional Forensic Center made a breakthrough in a homicide case dating back to more than three decades. In August, the RFC said investigators looked at other cases and found two cases that still had fingerprint cards attached. One of these cards was a homicide victim from 1987. The remains in the case were transferred to the University of Tennessee Forensic Anthropology Center in 2017. Now keep in mind, this baby was put up for adoption. He was put in a foster care, a foster home at his birth and his foster family ended up adopting him. So he began, as he got older, he began a search for his birth parents and he entered his DNA into some different genealogy bases and he got a hit on relatives of his mother. He also found his birth father, his biological father who did not know of his existence. His father told him that he barely knew this woman, that it had been a very casual thing and that he was unaware that he had a son. 
and he met the son w was able to connect with some of her relatives who told him the story of how she had not been seen that nobody in the family had seen or heard from her since right after she gave birth to this child as far as the, the police reports no one had ever filed a missing person report on her other than when she left this residential home Police did make contact with her in 1986. She was reported to have been living on the streets as a homeless person. They did not try to bring her back to this residential home or put her in custody or anything. And that was the last time that anyone reported knowing anything about her. So in 2019, the son, after he found out who his biological mother was, reported her missing to the Sacramento County Sheriff's Office. Gatrell, who was 25 years old at the time of her disappearance, had not been seen or spoken to from friends or family members since 1986. They took fingerprints and they kept her bones at this laboratory in University of Tennessee. The Sheriff's Office initiated a report and entered Gatrell in both the state and federal missing person database. They submitted the case to name us and began conducting a follow-up investigation. On August 20th, 2021, the Sacramento County Sheriff's Office was notified of a fingerprint match to a Jane Doe in Knox County, Tennessee. Her identity had remained unknown for almost 35 years. This fingerprint hit would not have been possible if it was not for the initiation of the missing person report. This was solved due to the diligence of the Sacramento County Sheriff's Office and the investigation by the Knox County Medical Examiner's Office. But I'm going to jump ahead a little more in this and say this would not have been possible had it not been for the girlfriend of this woman's biological son that she gave birth to. It was her who reached out to all these different agencies. She entered his DNA into as many different databases as possible trying to help him find where his mother may be because at that time nobody knew as far as anyone knew, she was not the Jane Doe. Had it not been for her work and her relentless pursuit to try to find this woman, they may still not know who she was. When I first started this story, it was just from the 2018 report on Reddit. She was still unidentified. No one, no one knew about this, this child having been born or who she was. At that point, she was still an unidentified Jane Doe. As Tina's son became older, he was on a mission to find his birth parents. He requested his sealed adoption papers and was direct and also did an ancestry DNA test. He was able to locate his mother's siblings who told him that they had not seen or spoken to his mother in over 30 years. If that wasn't heartbreaking enough, it got even worse. They didn't even have a photograph of her since the age of around 10 years of age. And at this time when this story is written, we are hoping and praying that new technology that someone reading this can find one of Tina's old mug shots. Now the girlfriend reached out to the different police agencies where Tina had been arrested this probably would have been in the early 80s, 82, 83, 84. They could find no mugshot of her. She even went to libraries and police departments and looked on microfilm to see if anyone had an updated picture of her. And it just says here that Tina was born in Massachusetts on an Air Force base to Floyd and Helen Gatrell. She had four brothers and one sister. 
but the stepmother reported that she was terribly abused as a child by her father and that they had had one child who had died in a very horrible accident and this was probably the accident where Tina was seriously injured. She had pins and screws in her body from where she, in her vertebrae, in her back, from where she had been in a, an accident. And while they couldn't find, or they didn't talk about it on any of these pages, her ex-stepmother reported that the, that the little boy had died in this accident and that Tina had been very badly injured. This could have been when her mental health problems started. She may have suffered from a brain injury. This this woman's story started out um, on Reddit as a unidentified code case. This was a young woman who was shot in what was supposed to have been a um, a break in. She and two other she and two men were accused of breaking into this home and she was the one doing the initial break and then kicking the door and stuff like that and she was shot. But the people in the area and a lot of people over the years have said the story's not as cut and dry as they want to make it. The two men that were with her claimed they didn't know her name and that they had simply picked her up as maybe a hitchhiker or came upon her in some way um, in Tennessee and had no idea who she really was. Other people believe that she was not trying to break into the home, but that she was actually trying to break away from these people, and that maybe she had been picked up and was being held. Some people say that the, the house that she was at was, a known, was known for criminal activity, and... Um, the people that she was there with were also known for criminal activity. Um, there's a picture here of the father and the son, and it's just said that he says he doesn't have any photos of her other than one that the family had of her when she was a young girl. And people were suggesting that maybe he check yearbooks from the schools that she may have attended. He might have been able to find pictures of her as a 14, 15, and 16 year old. The biggest mystery of all of this, I mean, who she was, um, the fact that she had this child, and that could have driven her to, if she was already suffering from some mental illness, which could have been nothing more than drug use, it could have been untreated bipolar disorder or something like that. Um, it could have also been postpartum depression and anxiety and stuff like that being not allowed to keep her child. And um, But what are, the biggest mystery of all of this is what happened to her from June of 1986 when she was came into contact with police in San Diego, California. And Tennessee, one year later, she's shot and killed. So the biggest mystery there is who was she with? Who did she travel with? The men who were with her that night told the police that she told them she was from Illinois. The robbery angle has been misconstrued. Drew. The homeowner was obviously thinking it was a home invasion. I think she was trying to break into the house because she was trying to get away from these men. And this is what, this is what these other people are saying as well. There's a police report. If you read between the lines, the police couldn't identify her. They had no idea of what was going on, so they picked up the other two men um, saying that they were investigating a robbery. They really didn't think it was a robbery. This was just a way of getting these two guys to talk. The 911 call supports the theory that Tina was trying to get away and trying to get help. I'm willing to speculate that these two men had frightened her on some level. 
I think deep down her instincts probably told her she was in danger. And even though she had this mental illness and this lifestyle that she was living, she was still able to re recognize that she was in danger. So she bolted from the garage where they were hanging out. She was probably making a big commotion to get attention from people in the homes around. Son has a partner named Elaine. I'm not sure if they are married or not. They have a daughter together. Anyway, she is the reason Tina's case was solved. She has, well, when anybody says that these cases have been solved, I beg to differ. Her identity has been solved, but how she came to be in Tennessee from California, what was going on in her life for that one full year that no one had seen her until she was killed, how did she come to be with these other men, who were they, and who along the United States came into contact with her within that year's time. So, Elaine has been looking for Tina for many years. She's the one that thought Tina may be a Jane Doe, so she did a Jed match with his DNA. I'm going to share Elena's story here because I forget that people without Facebook may not be able to see it. This will also help the general public who may be interested. Gun Jane would not be identified right now, and the system had failed her if Elena had not put in so much work. Her hard, wo her hard work should be recognized. Advocates do not advocate for missing persons or Jane or John Doe's for credit, but it sure feels good when our contribution is recognized. Some of us have put in up to 10 years of work trying to help these people be identified and get them home to their missing loved ones. If Tina's fingerprints had been entered into the database, she would have been identified years ago. Shotgun Jane Doe's case should have been one of the cases submitted to the DNA Doe Project when they first started. It breaks my heart to know that her information was never submitted, especially since it would not have been a cost to law enforcement. But the, uh, for all the people, I don't do that kind of work on my page. I just tell these stories in, in hopes to bring awareness about these people to others. Um, it might inspire somebody. And, and there may be someone out there right now who, God forbid, who may have a loved one to go missing. And you might know who to go looking <laughs> you know, the DNA Doe Project and Web Sleuths. And these are not just pages that were created to bring a, a story to people, but what they do is that they, they network. They put in the hours. They put in the weeks and months and sometimes years. I mean, there's so many different ones out there that you can go to to find information on a missing person or on their story unidentified code cases that the list goes on forever but it is the dna doe project and some of these others that actually go above and beyond that they actually find the person's dna they help to fund um, these searches so that these people like this woman's son can have her home. He never met her. He was taken from her immediately, never given a chance to know her. Just imagine, had she been taken instead of separated from her son and him sent to live in foster home and her sent basically to the streets. Imagine if they had let them stay together and gotten her the help she needed for her mental health, and, and maybe she wouldn't even have been able to have cared for him, but maybe if she had been at least allowed to see him, and she had that, you know, that knowledge that she was going to be able to see him, maybe she would have not taken to the streets. Then again, maybe she would have. 
um, but we'll we'll never know. But at least now he knows that his mother, you know, wasn't was didn't just give him away, but that he was basically taken from her, giving her no opportunity to have him. And uh, now he knows her name, and he knows where she was born, and who she was, and he knows some about her life. I reached out. This is the this is the girlfriend. This is the son's girlfriend speaking. I reached out to Tina's ex stepmother, and we were on the road once again to Southern California. She welcomed us with open arms and told us what a sweet child Tina was. Then came the horror stories of abuse from her father. We visited for a few hours and looked at uh, pictures. I saw one picture that caught my eye. It was a sweet, innocent face with a sweet smile. I held up the picture and said, Who is this person? And they said, That's Tina. She was only 10 years old and had a sweet, innocent face to go with all the horror stories of her childhood. So this was the only photo that they could find of her. There, were, there was one school photo and then one other photo. In August of 2021, Elena finally received the phone call that she'd been longing for. Paige Neeland was the deputy with the Sacramento Sheriff's Department. Paige reached out to Elena and informed her that Tina had finally been identified as a Jane Doe in Tennessee through fingerprints. Fingerprints had been on file for over 30 years in Sacramento from where this Tina had been arrested. Deputy Neyland took the time to listen to all the information that I had. She reached out and always responded to me any time that I asked any questions. I appreciate everything she has done for us. She continued to reach out to us and provide resources even after her part of the job was finished. She had gone above and beyond to help us. Now, because Tennessee had taken fingerprints of the Jane Doe when she was killed, they had never entered her DNA or her fingerprints into any of the databases of missing persons. I don't know why. Maybe it was just one of those old cases that just kind of got pushed away, pushed to the side. But once her fingerprints were linked from her arrest record in California to the fingerprints that were finally put on file after all those years, and they were able to identify her through her fingerprints. And once um, fingerprint testing, I, I'm guessing that they were able to do DNA to make sure that it was her. And when I first started making this video, if anyone stuck around, I know it's somewhat long, but I talked about the Blount County Jane Doe, who was thought to be from the Illinois area, and um, Tracy Sue Walker, who was from Indiana, and how they both ended up in the Knoxville area, and their remains had been found. Now, had Tina not been killed that night at that home because these, this young woman thought she was being burglarized or that somebody was trying to break in on her and her friend. Had they not shot and killed her that night, what may have happened to Tina? Was she a victim of trafficking? So as of right now, this is all I know about this story. I will continue to search for more on the two men and the two women that were involved in the shooting. Some people believe that this was some kind of cover-up and that she was actually at their home that night and maybe became irate in some way, was trying to get away from these people. Now, it jumps on ahead here to August of 2021. So sometime between July of 2021 when they went to visit the stepmother and August of 2021, Jared, uh, the son of the Jane Doe, 
was in a very bad motorcycle accident and was in a coma. He had a brain injury and it was during the time while his girlfriend was doing all this work trying to help find his mother. So not only were they, you know, going through all this research, they were she was also having to deal with this now, him just just starting to find out who he really was and who his parents were. How, he he now knew who, who his mother was. He knew a little bit about her background. He had met her um, siblings. So, not only was he, you know, going through all this confusion about his mother and trying to find out what had happened to her, he then suffered this motorcycle accident and this brain injury, so he was having to deal with that on top of everything. Twenty September of 2021, a, a poster, a comment on, on um, Web Sleuth says, The girlfriend just announced that Tina is on her way home. Her remains were cremated and they gave a tracking number and her remains were being sent back from Tennessee to California. And so that's kind of where the story ends. But for at least one full year of her life, from the time she was last seen in California until she ended up shot and killed in Tennessee, nobody really knows what happened to her. There may be people out there that she stayed with, that she had contact with, and maybe they just don't know her identity. Maybe over the years they've thought about this woman that they met along the way. But honestly... The lifestyle that she was living, I believe that she'd gotten mixed up with some people, probably some drug trafficking or something like that. And I believe that she just ended up kind of moving around place to place. They said they don't believe that she had spent a great deal of time in Tennessee. I think that she was probably hitchhiking from place to place and some way, somehow, she came into contact with these two men. And whatever was going on that night, these two men know the truth. They know whether they were chasing after her, what their intentions were, if they caught her. But that's how this story ends. And at least, as sad as this story is, and as, as big of a mystery as it was for so many years... And it's still a mystery as to how she came to be, you know, running down the street screaming for help. Um, at least now they know her identity, Tina Marie Gatrell, And her son now knows his identity, who his birth parents were. And maybe some more will come out about her life, but... I would say that that's pretty much where her story ends. And I appreciate everyone who stuck around. I know this story was a little long, but I wanted to add, because like I said, when I first started, when I first came upon this story, it was a very short little version of, a, of an unidentified Jane Doe, and it led to all of this. And I appreciate everyone for watching.